This is Supported Sexy, Episode 99, with Maral Sitar, CEO of BiblioCrunch and LearnSelfPublishingFast.com. Welcome to the Supported Sexy Podcast. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, producer, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I talk to women entrepreneurs who share their journeys and the true stories of their wins and their lessons and give you insight and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so excited to have you here. As you know, it just would not be the same without you. So today we are welcoming Maral Sitar, and I am so excited to have Maral on the show because I met her or actually heard her speak at an event for women in media. And she was talking about her company, BiblioCrunch, which is a platform that pairs self-publishing authors with professionals that they need. And her company has more than 17,000 authors on the platform and more than 1,200 professionals there to support them. These professionals being people who do design and marketing and all of the things that you need to publish your book. Now, as someone who has been a writer for as long as I can remember, I am fascinated by the publishing industry and very much interested in self-publishing. And I've had conversations before with people who I've spoken to about doing my own book, of course. And uh, there's been different schools of thought about whether traditional publishing is better or self-publishing is better or if they're both the same. And there are different opinions on both sides of it. But talking to Morale, it was great to hear her insight and tips having a business for the past five years that caters specifically to self-publishing. So she has BiblioCrunch and And then she also has her business, LearnSelfPublishingFast.com, which has incredible resources and courses that you can look into if you're interested in self-publishing. So on this episode, Morale talks about what she makes sure she does before every launch, how self-publishing has evolved in the past five years, why some authors choose self-publishing over traditional, and by some authors, she says people who have even gone the traditional route before may then choose to self-publish. Also, she talks about the myth that exists about self-publishing, the first three steps to take if you're going to self-publish your book, the sweet spot as far as pricing for your self-published book. I know that's something a lot of us go back and forth about. What is the pricing? Is the 99 cent book dead or the ebook dead? And lastly, what that five-star review really means and how you can go about getting them. So great resources, great tips, great insight from Aral. Really appreciate her being here. I know you're going to love this, especially if you are a writer or even if you're not a writer and you're interested in creating your own book. Because one of the other things we talk about is how books have sort of become like a business card. So make sure you listen to this and take note. So without further ado... Miral Sitar. So Miral, thank you so much for being here for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Elaine. Of course. Now, the first question I ask everyone, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Um, so I've actually been an entrepreneur since like high school and college. So my dad is an entrepreneur and he's also an engineer by background like me. And I'm an engineer by background, but my true passion is entrepreneurship. So I think um, I used to sell T-shirts with fun slogans that catered to South Asian women. I used to run a blog that catered to South Asian women because there was no blog back in 2003. And for by blog standards, it did really well. We had about like 100,000 readers um, come to it a month. Then... Um, I just love the idea of having an idea, launching it into the world and seeing how it does. And then it's even more rewarding when it makes money. And then you can actually support your lifestyle with it. So I also did like a, an iPod case business. And, um, and I wish I'd stuck with that because that's actually one of the most profitable businesses to be in right now if you're doing retail is like um, iPod cases. So I, I, I had like, maybe like a few thousand cases. I sold them all. I made back in returns and I actually, um, 
use money to like go on a couple trips. So, uh, those, those were like, I've always been kind of like an entrepreneur, like hustling and buying products and selling things. So it's kind of always been in me and I've always wanted like that idea that I can spend time on and, you know, turn it into like a real business. And that's what Biblia Crunch and Learn Self-Publishing Fast have turned into for me. I love that. And I love this idea of sort of just trying different things. I feel like a lot of us as entrepreneurs do that. It's sort of uh, trying different things until you find a thing that you want to do for the long term as far as starting businesses. Like I think sometimes people have this misperception that you have to know right away what that thing is going to be, jump into that and to commit to that forever. Yeah. And it's so easy now uh, with the different tools. Like I guess 10 years ago, you'd have to spend like half a million dollars to launch a business, like the website, everything. But now you can test something for like a few hundred dollars. Like a few years ago, you could get something up and running for less than 50,000 and you could change strategies like easily and test stuff out. So it's like technology has made it so much easier to, you know, do your tests um, pivot, do your test pivot. And, you know, it's just, it's just made everything a lot easier. Absolutely. Now, what was a young morale like as a little girl? Um, so the young girl grew up in Queens and New Jersey and, um, and I was very, very quiet and I was very, very shy and I didn't really speak that much. And people would ask me like, oh, where are you from? Like, why don't you speak English? And actually, because of that, and because my parents were from another country, uh, my dad came here for college, and then um, he went back to marry my mom, and then he brought her over. And um, and where are they from? Where is your family from? They're from, from? Pa- Pakistan. Mm-hmm. And so he brought her over, and so they didn't really know the education system here very well, and I was very quiet. So I was actually in ESL for a really long time until second grade, even though I spoke English very well. I was just very quiet. It's just like the public school teachers in New Jersey, like, had never, like, there weren't very many people of color back in central Jersey back then. Mm-hmm. And um, so they just didn't know English. So, but then when standardized tests came around, um, they gave me the standardized tests, and I scored really well on it. And then they gave me a couple IQ tests. They actually made me take the IQ test twice. And then I scored really well on that. So then they're like, oh, okay, so she must speak English. So they moved me out of ESL into the advanced curriculum. So Why do you uh, think they made you take the test twice? Is it because they couldn't believe how well you had done? Yeah, yeah. Mm. So the, I remember or they, mu- they must have thought I had cheated or something. Like they were just kind of dumbfounded that how could I have just gone through the system for so long for since, um, you know, kindergarten being in ESL. So. Interesting. It's funny. I had a, a similar experience as a young person. I would take classes or write papers actually was always a thing with me. And because I did well on them or was a good writer, teachers used to think that I cheated or something happened. I believe it had an effect on me. You know, it doesn't do much for your self-esteem for people to doubt your doubt your brilliance, uh, for lack of a better word. But, you know, you come through it as as you did and you create something that you love anyway. Yeah. And and, I mean, there were a lot of other people, like a few other people who weren't who didn't speak English, like were from India or their parents were from India and Pakistan. So I guess they were just stereotyping me kind of like that. Uh, I don't know if you heard that story about that doctor on that plane where they didn't yes, believe he was a doctor. Yes. And then another person stood up and basically said the same thing. Like, well, I'm a doctor and they believe them. No problem. Yeah. The mm-hmm. world we live in. Oh, well, we made it anyway. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> who would you say were some of your greatest influences growing up? Um, my greatest influences growing up. Uh, I read a lot. Um, cause I was very shy. I didn't really talk to a lot of people. I didn't have very many friends growing up in elementary school. And when I started college, I remember, um, I made an active decision to be more social and friendly. So co- like college, I had a pretty good social life. And after college, I've had a pretty good social life and I have a lot of close friends, but growing up, my biggest influences were my dad, I guess, cause he, he, he's made it and um broken it so many times um like he started he started several companies and the first few didn't didn't do well and he said well even if you get back to zero or even if you're like in debt you can always make it back and he's a very 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 successful entrepreneur and i remember like whenever i try to do like a retail sell something retail um if i'd go to we would go to these conferences and he's like, never back, bring back any inventory ever. Like you want to promote your brand. And he's like, just once you hit costs, like you're done. And that's good promotion. So he's actually guided a lot 
um, a lot in business, but he understands the retail business really well. So that's why it's been a little hard for him to, it took him like a little bit longer to understand like, what is this digital books business that I'm working in? Like Mm -hmm. where, how can you make money or like, what is the point? Like, what am I doing? So uh, he's probably one of my biggest influences. And my mom too is uh because they always supported me like any classes I wanted to take or anything like we would they would always register me and let me take take them so how do you think who you were as a a young person has evolved into who you are as an entrepreneur today um I would say the hustle has always been in me Mm -hmm. (laughs) so um I'm the oldest of four children and um and I was oh and the oldest of a lot of grandchildren on uh, one side of the family. So I would always, I was the one who arranged everything, who was in charge of everything, who executed all the plans and kind of took care of everything. So I was, I was kind of like a mini, uh, a mini leader in my own family. Um, and I was just used to taking care of people and taking care of things. So I guess maybe that kind of helped me if, just being able to take charge. Like, nobody ever told me that, Oh, like you can't launch this or why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. Um, actually when I did take a traditional job, uh, after I graduated, I was an engineer for a while. My dad's like, why, why are you an engineer? Why do you want to work for somebody? Like, why don't you start your own company? And he would always say like, why do you want to work for somebody else? Like, like my dad is one of those people who believes like everyone should start their own company and given the way uh, things are going in like 20, 30 years, everyone will be their own bosses. Right. Or, you know, so, um, so there, so there is kind of truth to that. That's interesting. Well, uh, certainly it's not, in, um, it's not surprising. I should say that your dad really was an advocate for that because of his background and what he accomplished. But why do you think, even though you had this part of you that obviously loved to create businesses or ideas or sell things that you went sort of the traditional route at first because you studied engineering in, in college, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I studied engineering. Um, I actually didn't have any ideas back then and I did, and I didn't, um, and I didn't know too many entrepreneurs. So my first job out of college was to work at a startup as an engineer. And then that's when you start meeting interesting people. And that's when you uh, start networking with people. And then I started going uh, to events. And the first time I actually lived. So when I gra- when I applied to college, my parents said, okay, you can apply to anywhere, which is an hour radius of <laughs> where we live. So that's what I did. And, you know, I got it. Uh, and I went to Columbia for undergrad. And then um, but the minute school was over, the expectation was to move back home. So, so I moved back home for uh, a couple of years. And then I commuted to the city for work. And so while I, while I commuted, I would go out a lot and I would go to all the entrepreneurship events. And this is back in like 2001, 2002. And you got to meet a lot of the interesting people and all the interesting things that they were doing. And since I did have a technical background, I knew the level of effort involved to like launch something and take it to completion. And eventually my role evolved from engineer to project manager to product manager. So I knew how to launch a project from start to finish. And also um, my most recent traditional job was I was a product senior product manager at Time Magazine. And I joined when the magazine is going through a huge shift from print to digital. So I actually got to work on a lot of projects from start to finish, like build the teams and launch the products. And they were very successful. Like we had, we, uh, we launched the new video channel for time magazine. We launched the website, the blogs, the podcasts, um, and the mobile apps. Uh, uh, it's hard to believe that before 2010, there were no mobile apps. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, they're a relatively new thing. So I had the chance to work on that. So I would say that's part of, part of what, like I had kind of an entrepreneurship role in my last traditional job too. And my bosses did give me the flexibility uh, to work on a lot of entrepreneurship stuff. And then, it, and then you went back to school at some point for your master's in publishing, right? Yeah. So I actually did that while I was at Time. So, uh, and they, they helped, they helped me out with that. So if you do, if you, if you major in something that's kind of related to your job, they, they pay for it. So Mm, that worked out, but it was very hard because, uh, you, you work five days a week and then you go to school four days a week. So it's like full-time school and full-time, uh, job. So it's for two years, you're just working very, very hard, but the, um, I went, I did the new media studies program at NYU, which I loved. Like you actually, cause I knew, I knew I wanted to work in media. I knew I wanted to work in publishing either book 
or magazine publishing. And I had actually gone into the program thinking I would do magazine publishing or come up with a new way to, um, to get revenue for magazines. But I actually went in with one idea and I came back, um, with uh, discovering the book publishing industry because in 2011 what I discovered is books were going through this whole revolution that magazines had gone through a um, few years before so um, back in 2006 is when you had your first bloggers and you had your blogging platforms and in 2011-2012 uh, books kind of were going through that same transition self-published authors are basically kind of like the bloggers of 2006 and initially um, people looked down on them. People said, oh, like, why would you want to self-publish a book? Or why would you want to do your own blog? You can work for a big media organization. And now we're finding that um, self-published authors make up 40% of the best sellers on Amazon. And that's amazing. And a lot of self-published authors actually choose to publish self, let's say choose to self-publish first. Besides traditional, a lot of traditionally published authors are choosing to self-publish now too. Amazing. Now, when did the point, when did you come to the point, I know it was the year 2011, but what was the uh, point where you decided to create BiblioCrunch, the business you have now, which works with self-published authors and uh, publishing professionals and brings them together? So the first iteration, um, so I was working on my, on my grad school program, I was working on my thesis, and I was trying to discover different revenue models for magazines uh, because the model that we'd been working on for so long was trying to get people to pay for article content and Huffington Post was new at the time, BuzzFeed was new at the time and they were killing us in traffic and people weren't really interested in buying our content. So what the idea that I had come up with uh, was making um, eBooks based on breaking news content and we had some of the best journalists. Time had some of the best journalists in the world, and Time is part is a smaller company within um, a much bigger brand. So you had everyone from CNN as part of the parent company, Fortune, People, um, CNN Money, Money Magazine, and we had some of the best, best, best journalists. We had some of the best editors in the world. So I pitched to the bosses, I had an executive sponsor and we kind of pitched around the idea of breaking up books based on breaking news events. And we, he said, okay, let's put together the prototypes. And when I started putting together the prototypes, uh, the prototypes actually were really cumbersome and hard to make. So what I did is I was like, Oh, I, I think I could quickly build a tool that would make it easy for me to take one word document or take an HTML page and convert it into like the EPUB, Mobi, PDF, basically the different formats that get read on the e-readers. And then someone's like, oh, why don't you make that tool available for everyone else? And so I did. And that actually um, was a huge, 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 which I thought was such a great idea. But when I actually pitched it to people, people are like, oh, I would never use this tool. I write in Word, in Word first. Like, does your tool convert my PDFs? to the ebook formats or mm. does your tool create covers for me so um that was my first mistake is like not getting feedback from people and not actually like uh getting feedback for launching new tools so now whenever we launch something we always make sure we get feedback and we make sure it's something that people want because you don't want to build something that no one's going to use which is what we initially did so that was the first product in 2011 so when people started asking questions about do you have someone that you does this or do you have someone that this that's where the idea of the marketplace came around and in 2012 is when the market when we launched the marketplace so tell us exactly what biblio crunch does now what you're known for and i love the business as i told you so tell us what exactly it does okay. and how it works oh yeah sure so there's two two parts of the business um the first one is biblio crunch and bibliocrunch.com b-i-b-l-i-o-c-r-u-n-c-h.com and that is a marketplace that connects authors and publishers with vetted publishing professionals. So let's say you are an editor or a cover designer or a fact checker, proofreader, or someone who does PR and publicity, you could actually create a profile um, which showcases all your skills. And let's say an author or an editor, uh, let's say an author or a publisher is looking for a copy editor or a developmental editor, what they would do is, they would post their needs on BiblioCrunch and um, they would post their budget and how long they want someone, what kind of editor they're looking for. And they would get proposals from members of our platform. So we have about 
um, seven, more, more than 17,000 authors right now and about 1,200 professionals who provide services to those authors. Wow. So that's the first part of the business. And then the second part of the business is, um, so part of BiblioCrunch, we have something called our VIP membership where we kind of guide you, where you have access to all our resources and we guide you through how to self-publish a book. But based on that, we came up with um, the idea of doing courses, like author training courses. So we have different, and it's called Learn Self-Publishing Fast. So we have courses on how to self-publish your book in 24 hours or less. And it's, it goes through the whole process of self-publishing your book, um, how to market your book, um, how to do social media as an author, how to leverage SEO as an author, uh, how to uh, unlock Amazon secrets, or, um, how to become a bestseller. Those are all the the courses that we have on our site right now. So those are two different parts. One is our educational site, which is Learn Self Publishing Fast, and one is our um, the BiblioCrunch site, which connects authors with uh, professionals who want to put together teams to publish their books and self publish their books. Excellent. And it's learnselfpublishingfast.com, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. For anyone listening, I'll have links to everything, but just in case anyone wants to go over there right now while they're listening. Um, <laughs> how would you say self-publishing has evolved in the past five, four or five years since you started your business? What are some of the things that you've seen? Well, back then, uh, I was very excited about self-publishing, but no one else was. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing about being early in the game. <laughs> Yeah, no, they're like, oh, why would we want to work with self-published authors? Or like, oh, why would anyone want to self-publish a book? Self-published authors are authors who couldn't get a traditional book deal. So mm-hmm. that that's what the climate was um, in 2010 to uh, 2011. And, and no one, like everyone thought that self-published authors were kind of like second-class citizens. But now self-published authors uh, make up 40% of the bestsellers on Amazon. And... Um, ebook consumption is growing because of that. And what would you say um, is still, is that still, I should say, the biggest misconception about self publishing authors that, you know, oh, these are people who couldn't get a book deal? Yeah, I would say so. You have a lot of traditional authors now who decide to pursue the route of self publishing because they want better than the 7 to 15% royalties that a publisher offers them. They want control over the process and the cover. And they want to push out books faster. Like if you notice any traditionally published book, any trilogies, they release them on a year schedule. So if I just read a book that was released in October 2016, the next book is not going to be released until October 2017. And it literally takes like three years to read a series book. And whereas self-published authors, it's like, you know, turn it out fast. And once you sign a book deal, you may see your book in 18 months. But as a self-published author, you'll see your book um as soon as you, once you've written it, edited it, cover design, and you can push it out into the world. So it's much, much faster and there's much more control. And one of the things I was thinking about um, earlier when you were talking, just uh, the, some of the authors that I know who have gone the traditional publishing route and, you know, some of them are bestsellers or New York Times bestsellers. And everyone talks about the struggle or the issue of going back and forth, mainly about your cover, what you want mm-hmm. your book to look like and all of those things. So that's something for people to keep in mind. Not that that's the only, you know, I'm sure there are benefits to going the traditional route, but I know a lot of authors I know are very open about it's not as easy as everyone thinks. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And the, co- the cover control is a huge, huge thing because you have right now you have access to all the resources that um, traditional publishers uh, had. So, mm-hmm. and you have access to the same cover designers and the same editors, except you're paying out of pocket now instead of um, the publisher paying for it. And another part of that is, too, um, people talk about the marketing. You know, you end up doing a lot of the marketing. And, and I know you have a, a course on marketing on learn uh, learnselfpublishingfast.com. But a yeah. lot of people talk about the market. Even if you go through a traditional publisher, you have to do so much marketing yourself most times, unless you're a huge name, obviously. Yeah, but. yeah, definitely. And they aren't going to spend a lot of money on marketing your book. And they tend to pick authors who already have platforms because they want to um, pick authors who because the thing is, like, I mean, the goal is to publish good stories, but you want to publish the good stories that sell, too. So if um, an author doesn't really have, like, any presence, like, they don't have a mailing list, like, a publisher is less likely to publish your book. 
Mm-hmm. What would you say are the first steps um, or, or your top three tips for someone who says, OK, I'm going to self-publish my book? What would you say to that person as, OK, these are the first three things that you need to do? Well, first, I would say define your goals. Number one, do you want to do you want sales or do you want a lot of people to read your book? Because if you want sales or if you want a lot of people to read your book, the way you approach it will be very different. If you want a lot of people to read your book, there's different platforms that you could use, like Wattpad, where you can actually go and publish stories on Sline and build a following, but you're not going to make any money that way. Um, I've had authors who want to publish family stories. And when I, when I speak to them initially, I ask them, what's your goal? Like, if you want to sell this book to a lot of people, it might not sell because it's your family story. And, and there isn't, there isn't a market for it besides your own family. So it's just important, number one, to define your goals because that kind of sets your expectations too. Um, number two, do your research. A lot of people do not do their research. You, any vendor you use, like I would urge you to go, like do Google BiblioCrunch negative reviews, Google learn self-publishing fast negative reviews. Hmm. A lot of our authors have actually been scammed by um, vanity presses. So if you're thinking of using a, a vendor, just Google the name of the vendor and negative reviews and make sure you're familiar with the process and, uh, and the space, like, like read blog posts before you actually like pick to work with anyone. So like doing your research is the second most important thing. And then number three, like once you kind of have everything figured out, let's say you've used us or, um, or you've taken our training course, training series, you want to treat it like your business and you want to treat it like your baby. Um, and I always say I have three babies. I have two small children. I have a three year old and a a six month old. And, um, and I have Biblio Crunch. Mm-hmm. And so those are my three children. So you want to, one, define your goals, two, do your research and, you know, uh, treat it, treat it like your, like your business because you're going to be working on it every day. It's not the thing where you write your book and you hit publish and it's going to sell itself. It takes a lot of work to market it and get people to read it. Right. Now, going back to number two, where you said about, um, you know, doing the research and looking up the negative reviews, which I think is so smart and important. But through BiblioCrunch, you guys actually have a vetted list of service providers that you work with, right? Yeah, yeah. So we pre-vet everyone before we let them join our platform. And we actually reject a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have any experience in the book publishing industry, and you apply to be an editor, we're not going to let you in. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. And then the first one where you mentioned some people, for example, want to publish their story, or other authors may say, I just want to get as many people as possible versus, as you said, uh, making money off the book. What would be other reasons that someone might say, I just want to reach as many people as possible? Um, let's say they have another business and, or they have a nonfiction business. Um, or I mean, they have a business that's, and they write a book, um, like a guide. Like if you are, uh, like a SEO, if you have SEO consulting service, then you might write a free book on SEO tips to kind of build leads into your SEO business. Mm -hmm. Um, if you are a blogger and you do cookbook, uh, if you are a blogger and you do recipes, you might want to, um, you know, do your book as a way to get lead in, uh, as a way to generate sales or a mini book. Um, I mean, the biggest thing I've seen is it, like exercise coaches. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll give away free books um, because they want people to join their exercise plans. And that's just one way of doing it. Or they'll give away cookbooks on how to eat healthy so people can actually join their more expensive plans. So that, that's just one thing to consider that a book has basically become kind of like a business card for your business. Right. Like a marketing, um, its own marketing tool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Now, are those kinds of uh, books that people do in that way, are they usually a certain length? Do you find, is it better to be longer, shorter as a guide? You know, do you want to, however many page guide or is it better to be concise? Um, I think it's better to be concise, Mm -hmm. uh, but also tell it from a narrative story. Um, In guides, I would say anywhere from like 20 to 75 pages is great. Okay, good. Now about pricing, I've heard you say that the days of the 99 cent ebook are dead. Yeah. What would you say is the sweet? Well, I I wouldn't say dead. I would say they're less popular than what they were. Yeah. Okay, great. You're much more diplomatic than I am. Less <laughs> Excellent. Now, what, do you, what would you say then is the sweet spot as 
far as pricing or is there a sweet spot for your oh, um, self-published I would, book? I would say for your self-published book, if you have an ebook and it's like a 250 page ebook, your sweet spot, you should play with pricing between $2.99 and $5.99. Um, you don't want to price your book under $2.99 and you don't want to price your book over $9.99 because then your royalties drop from 70% to less than 35%. So you want to stay between the two ninety nine to nine ninety nine range. Now that being said, historically, authors used to price their books at ninety nine cents, um, and people used to buy them, and you know that was your path to riches. But now, uh, as authors are experimenting with higher prices, people are still buying books at higher prices, and they're adding more value because they cost more. So now the ninety nine cent books are kind of seen a little bit as junk. Um, and also if you have a nonfiction book, you could price your book even higher. And that's just basically uh, what the book data has shown. Mm-hmm. Now, how much weight should a self-published author put on acquiring reviews? Because I know that's something I've heard people say a lot more now in their um, pitches, for lack of a better word. It's sort of like mm-hmm. my book is on Amazon and it's received, you know, 345 reviews. But the number of reviews sounds seems to be important or five star reviews. Oh, definitely. You want to make sure you have more than four star reviews, because um, if you're getting less than four star reviews, then there is something about your book that needs to be fixed. Like it's not a high quality product. It's like getting a C for mm-hmm. like a product. So if you're getting like less than four star reviews, you want to check that. And also one of the first things that a person does when they purchase a book, like if you tell someone about your book, they're like, oh yeah, I'll check it out on Amazon right now. And if there's zero reviews, it's going to discourage people from buying it because no one has vouched for your book. Mm -hmm. Um, A review is basically like a point for your book. Like, oh yeah, like 20 other people said they read it or 30 other people said they read it. Now, um, now if someone has done like a thousand positive reviews, then yeah, I'm going to buy the product. Uh, like it works the same way, like for baby products that I buy, like if it gets like seven stars and there are three, I'm not going to buy it. But if it has like 500 stars and they're all over 4.5, then I'm more likely to buy it because other people have vouched it, read it and liked it. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as we know, the reviews, though, don't help necessarily for your um, ranking in Amazon, for example. You know, as as far as we know, again, there's no algorithm. Like if you have more reviews, you'll rank higher when people are searching for X. Well, if you have more reviews, um, you'll show if you have more sales, let's say Mm -hmm. uh, people you'll show up as related books for other books. And Amazon kind of doesn't tell you how their algorithms work. Other right. authors have kind of just kind of speculated. So, but the reviews actually, it's more for like, let's say if you want to run a book sale and you want to get accepted into the big advertising sites and there's a bunch out there um, and you want to drop your price or do a sale that you're not going to be accepted into your sites if you don't have at least 20, 20 reviews. And what are the best ways for us to obviously getting people to read the book and and vouch for it and leave a review, but say I'm just starting, I just put my book up. What's my first step with looking for a review or getting a review? So you want to actually first make a marketing plan and um, make a list of all the people that you could reach out to. So first you want to reach out to your friends um, and you want to reach out to your colleagues. Uh, you want to let everyone know that you're writing a book, like send a mass email to your address book. I mean, don't spam them every day, mm-hmm. but at, invite them to join your list. And um, if they say yes, then you can ask them if they want to write a review for your book. But just be clear that when you do ask them to do that, they have to, um, they should write in the review. I got this book, um, for a, a review copy of this book and I'm writing it. I'm writing a review on Amazon for it uh, because the champ purchased the book and Amazon is cracking down on reviews. So they don't want reviews from someone who is your husband or wife mm-hmm. or your partner. And they don't want reviews from someone who lives with you. So if they suspect that it's like your mom writing the review, they'll delete it right away. So oh, interesting. Good to know. Yeah. I think so I feel like that's where people would start. Yeah, that's where people start, like family and friends and colleagues. And then there, then you want to um, 
find bloggers and there's like a specific strategy to find and identify bloggers for your book. And the easiest way to do that is like Google books similar to yours and, you know, re- start reaching out to those bloggers. And then um, the third place is uh, Amazon top reviewers. Like Amazon actually has a list of top reviewers that you can access and extract their emails of um, who can actually start reviewing your books. Very good. What would you say has been, I know you talked about research being so valuable and some other things, but as far as marketing overall, what's one of the biggest mistakes you see self-published authors make when it comes to marketing in particular? Um, They only talk about their book and they will sign up to every single social media site and all they tweet about is their book. And they send you too many emails, <laughs> and mm-hmm. and and I'll say I did not sign up for this email. Like I don't, I met you once at a networking event, and you send me like three emails a day. Like slow down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um and you know like or if you're on Twitter, like I don't want to see just you promoting your book. So doing a more of a mixture of supporting other people as well as providing information, providing value, as they say. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I made this mistake too when I first joined Twitter. I would only tweet about my company, and then now I tweet very little about my company, and mostly just like personal, personal stuff on social media now. Mm-hmm. Excellent, great, great tips and advice. I'm so glad to be able to talk to you and hear all of that and share that. <laughs> what would you say? Um, what would you say as far as entrepreneurship? What has it taught you about yourself as a woman? Um, you have to work very, very hard. Um, because, uh, I mean, initially, uh, we did seek funding, and we did have people interested in funding our company, but we decided not to take the funding because because I wanted more autonomy, and I wanted to be in a better position um, than, you know, when you don't have any users or anything. But the thing is, like, when you're pitching to people, it, it's kind of like... Uh, people want to invest in people that are like them. And most of the investors are middle-aged, older Caucasian people. So you have to work 20 times harder to actually get like an investment from some of these people. So that I thought was the most challenging is like presenting to these like stone faced older guys. Um, And, and, and then we're like, Oh, like who built the platform? Um, and I'd say I did. They're like, oh, you don't look like an engineer. And it's just dealing with some of those. Right. What, that, that. Yeah. Right. what does that mean? Exactly. Yeah. So is that something, is that a decision that you're still um, very happy about that you made? Or have you thought about at this point now that you're a few years into your business taking on investors or maybe investors? Oh, in a we might, way? Yeah, I, I think I think we might. I think we're in a good position now. So um, like we're definitely earning a lot more and um and our business is pretty healthy so and i want to grow it uh a lot more so and the only way to do that is to take outside investment Mm -hmm. now is it just yourself or do you have co-founders as well uh i founded the company but i have a lot of uh, employees that i work with which are kind of like Mm co-founders so we have a team of seven people oh okay that's a decent sized team excellent what does your um what does your support network look like uh, my support network is my husband, um, my family. Like he actually, because of him, I was able to quit my job and work on this idea. Uh, I mean, I would pitch him like different, and he's his background is he used to be a venture capitalist, and um, and now he works in finance. And I pitch him ideas all the time. He's like, I don't think you can quit your job. Mm-hmm. for that or like I don't think you can quit your job for this and I, I had a pretty comfortable job I made like six figures uh and I had great benefits I worked at time but I was kind of itching to do something else and do my own thing so he's my biggest um supporter and then like my friends like my good female friends who want to see other females succeed like they helped me spread the word about Bibler Crunch and um about what we do and then my old time colleagues were really helpful. And then also the great thing about my grad school is uh, the professors there were wonderful. So I reached out to them and they connected me to the execs at other publishers. So they actually helped me a lot back then. And then also I'm part of professional media organizations like the women's media group. So um, like networking or organizations that actually like add value, like they're not organizations that I've joined just to be part of them, but because mm-hmm. I enjoy 
meeting interesting women doing interesting things. So, Which is very important, which is how I learned about you. <laughs> so good to be in those groups. Now, if you think over your life and your career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Um, I would probably say my husband because because he would always tell me like he's he's like he will take the kit like he'll and he work he works a lot and he works long hours but he'll take the kids for a weekend um so I can so I can I can move forward with my business and he says he wants me to <laughs> be really successful so he could take a break too so um because he want he wants and it's kind of a joke. I don't think he's not the type of person who would take a break from work, but, mm -hmm. or from a traditional corporate job. Um, but he wants, he wants to see me succeed and he's been my biggest supporter. And he's also been my biggest critic too. Cause sometimes when you see a model not working, you need someone to tell you like, that's not working. You're not making any money. Mm -hmm. Like I think you need to pivot and do something else. So. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that with us. I think that's great and so important. I've talked to people who are married before who talk about the importance of your partner being with you in some kind of way. Yeah. Excellent. So how can we support you? I'll have links to um, bibliocrunch.com, of course, and uh, learnselfpublishingfast.com. But any other ways that we can support you, what, what can we do? Oh, yeah. Um, you can you can read. Actually, it's how can I help you? Um, if you're publishing a book, and, and you want to read like publishing advice uh, with actionable tips and learn how to be a bestseller, you can actually go to our blog, Bibliocrunch slash blog. Um, you can follow us on social media at Bibliocrunch.com. You can follow me at Moral.com, M-I-R-A-L-S-A-T-T-A-R. Uh, we have our books for sale and then we have our courses for sale. Um, and right now we have a course for $47.00 for um, a course package that we have for 300. So if you're interested in buying that course, just tweet at BiblioCrunch and we'll give you the discount code to buy that. Excellent. Thank you so much. That's great. You're welcome. You're might welcome. Have, might have to tweet you for that one. That's a good but, one. <laughs> now, before you go, um, and I, again, I so appreciate your time and all the tips and advice, which I knew you'd be full of. What mm -hmm. would you say is a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything? Um. Don't listen to the naysayers. Like if you believe in an idea, go out, um, build your team, launch it and, you know, test it out with the world. And most, I feel like as a woman, most of the people who will be skeptical of you and, and New York is kind of like that, like it's so finance heavy. And um, a lot of the networking events where I would go with other CEOs, it's all males. And it's just really, it's, it's, it's really, really hard because they don't take you seriously, especially if you're nice and friendly. They're like, oh, she can't, there's no way she can run a company. So just keep on, keep on doing what you're doing and find your safe space and, you know, network with those people in the safe space. And that's how you'll get ahead and, you know, the connections that you need. Miral Sitar, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Elaine. Okay. I'm so excited to be here. Bye. Excellent. Hold on just one second. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. And the challenge for you is to take at least one thing. You can always do more than one thing, but take at least one thing and incorporate that into your business today. Take action today. Also, be sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com to get more information about this episode and to see previous interviews that I've done with other fantastic women entrepreneurs. And while you're there, be sure to go to the free resources button so you can see what kind of resources I'm offering to you guys. Right now, it is a three-part audio training on how to make brave decisions. The decision to do something is sometimes scarier than even the actual doing. So go Go to supportissexypodcast.com, go to the top, click free resources, and download that free audio training. All right, so thank you so much again for listening. Until next time, you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.